we are now on the sixth lecture of uh, this very topic learning and we would be talking about insight learning now. You all know Kohler, we talked about him you know uh, when we were talking about uh, gestalt principles. So, the founder of gestalt psychology Kohler, he did an ex interesting experiment on chimpanzee and that chimpanzee was uh, you know, named Sultan. It was you uh, know a very interesting type of an experimentation. Sultan was put in a cage and the banana was you uh, know put beyond his reach. Okay. So, you can imagine the situation Sultan in the cage, banana at a distance and two sticks were also kept there. Now, the distance of the banana was such that the chimpanzee Sultan was not able to extend his hand through the bars of uh, the cage to reach the banana. If he would have used the first stick, so the length of the hand plus the length of the stick still would not uh, reach uh, the banana. But if Sultan could fit those two sticks together and hold it, then the length of the arm plus the length of the first stick plus the length of the second stick, this length would be, you know, help Sultan reach the banana. Okay. This is what Kohler did and he wanted to see how chimpanzee processes the information and what type of response Sultan comes forward with. And you can see the photograph here. Okay. Sultan basically you know, uh, kept observing uh, the bunch of banana kept there and the two sticks. Then what he did? He simply took the first stick, second one he just fixed uh, one in the other and then Sultan dragged the banana using the stick. Okay. This was an interesting demonstration of a very, very peculiar phenomena what is called as insight learning. Sultan had that insight. Okay. It was again it is a pure case of problem solving that we have been talking about. Uh, okay. But then so, uh, Sultan unlike the previous case did not try out options. Okay. He just you know had some approximation based on which thought of a possible consequence and executed it. Finally, Sultan could solve the problem. Is it uh, that uh, Sultan would be successful only uh, in case of uh, the two sticks put there? That means, uh, there is uh, you know somewhere a mental map that you draw in terms of uh, the possible uh, sequences that can result you into the desired behavior. Following researchers, what they did, now you can see in the image on the, your screen now, banana was uh, hanged to the ceiling. Okay. Cases where you know, banana could be simply you know, plucked through uh, the help of the stick, the way it was done in the case of a banana uh, outside the cage. It was just that instead of putting on the ground, the banana was uh, attached to the ceiling and uh, uh, Sultan had to drag it. Other cases where some uh, no crates were kept, the wooden crates were kept there. And then although multiple crates were kept, the chimpanzee could sense that although I have an access to three crates, only two crates are sufficient okay, to reach the height where the banana is hanging. And several such manipulations were done in the entire experimentation. I am not showing you the full images, sequence of images rather. But say, two uh, say uh, horizontal boxes, one horizontal, one vertical uh, you know, layout of the box, horizontal, two second horizontal, but then because it is a square box, so the chimpanzee was not able to reach the banana, some other chimpanzee has to help. And then you realize that all of these things actually took place. Now, the second chimpanzee when they were put in a group situation, this group somehow uh, you know, collaborated, they helped each other in order to reach the banana, because the thickness of the thigh of uh, you know, uh, one chimpanzee was needed to add the desired height. So, these are interesting demonstrations of insight learning as to how uh, you know, in a novel type of a situation, we use our uh, cognitive map, we use our uh, past experience to uh, know, think of the possible uh, solutions that would help resolve the problem. Okay. And I am sure all of you, all of you have uh, you know, several of these experiences with you. Having discussed all these things now, because we are on our last lecture, 
Let us now focus on the biocultural factors and those biocultural factors that would play extremely important role okay, in cognitive learning. First important thing of course, we have talked about it the cognitive map that is uh, basically the mental representation of the structure of the physical space, how things are, the layout. You can imagine uh, you know, say for instance, uh, we took the example of this uh, you know, uh, route map from your house to your school or your college, but take example, you know, uh, say you are visiting an office area which is say spread into six floors and you go on the third floor of the building but still you can make a sense of how that space would be. Okay. So, the movement pattern although you are not given uh, training into going into this building, there is no previous exposure to it, but you can still find route for yourself okay. with the help of signages, with the help of uh, mental map of the constructed space that you have with you. You can think in a given situation what would be the layout, okay, which areas to search for and which areas to eliminate. Cognitive map therefore, uh, no, is always uh, of great help to us as human beings. Second important, uh, we talked about the insight learning, no? one form of problem solving where the organism develops sudden insight. Okay? Uh, the individual suddenly understands what could be the possible solution in this very case. I am sure uh, many a times you know, uh, in your earlier examinations, if you were stuck on a given question you would suddenly you know think that okay, this could be one of the ways of so, resolving this very problem, you work it out okay. and uh, sometimes you must have succeeded that you thought that this could this is how the problem this numerical problem could have uh, been sorted out, you do so and you succeed. From a biological point of view, there are certain things which are extremely important because of the simple fact that you are a biological creature. The, uh, the important concepts here are one preparedness. Preparedness basically is the uh, what you call predisposition of a given species to learn things in certain ways and not in the other way. Okay. Therefore, it is basically a species a specific biological predisposition. Uh, let me give you an interesting example. The famous uh, scientist Cornet Lorange. Uh, he worked on uh, you know, the species specific behavior and basically he was uh, trying to understand how the ducklings behave. What he observed was uh, that when the eggs of the ducks, it, when it hatches and when the ducklings come out, the mother duck will start you know, moving towards a water body and uh, all these uh, newly born ducklings, they would follow the mother the mother will go into the water body and will start swimming and so will these young ducklings. This uh, you know, uh, made uh, uh, Lorange did a fantastic experiment. What he did was that uh, he replaced the mother duck and instead of the mother duck with the outfit which made him look like a duck, he thought that probably the ducklings would be guided by this. When the eggs hatched out and the ducklings came out, Lorenz started you know, going towards the water body, then he started swimming and all these ducklings religiously followed Lorenz. Next time Lorenz what he did? He removed the output, it was just like a normal human body uh, and the ducklings came out, he, they saw Lorenz and they again started you know, religiously following Lorenz and they went to the water body. And then you know several other researchers did, uh, repeated uh, this type of an experiment. But the reason I am quoting this uh, experiment here is that it is the biological predisposition of the ducklings okay, to uh, you know, uh, follow the mother duck in order to learn swimming. So, swimming is basically a species specific behavior and this species specific behavior has to be learned in a certain way and not in the other way. It is not that no, the ducklings will have to get registered, will have to go to the swimming pool, will have to meet a coach, pay the fee, the way we humans do. Okay. We are uh, no, not biologically predisposed to learn things that way, whereas ducklings are. And entire animal kingdom you would realize that there is 
a concept called critical period that within this limited amount of time you have to be exposed to that very situation. Okay. Uh, say like uh, in the previous uh, lectures we saw the pigeons pecking. Pecking in many many uh, birds is basically a species a specific behavior and uh, when the uh, babies they come out of the egg, okay, the mother bird is supposed to make them learn how to peck and this pecking has to uh, you know, take place within a very very shorter period of time immediately after birth. Okay. So, that is what I am referring to according to the uh, researches that are available with us. Now, one of the most important biology, uh, the biocultural factor is the level of preparedness uh, that is needed to learn a behavior. Second interesting thing which is related to preparedness is what is called as instinctive drift. Drift means you withdraw, instinctively means it is already biologically predisposed in you. So, what you do in terms of uh, uh, instinctive drift basically is that you are already biologically endowed with uh, that insight that in certain type of situation which basically goes against uh, you know, the way you are biologically programmed you withdraw. Why? You have a tendency to revert to your instinctive behavior okay, that interferes with the way you are supposed to learn as a biological creature. So, if I am supposed to learn something for instance picking, for instance swimming, okay, if I am supposed to learn you know, this very behavior in one way and if you give me some other route to learn it, okay, it interferes with my learning and then the moment that happens I will you know, suddenly withdraw, I will revert to my instinctive behavior that is called instinctive drift. Couple of things which are also important are factors like local enhancement. Okay. Local enhancement basically you know, refers to locating uh, foraging sites by attending to others, okay. uh, which also is associated with social facilitation. Okay. Social facilitation again you know uh, when you do something uh, more vigorously when you are in a group setup. Okay. So, you behave uh, you know, uh, in a little different way when you are in a expo, uh, outer situation, outside situation, you are exposed to others. The way you sit when you are all alone in your house to watch uh, television is different from the way you uh, sit in the auditorium when there are people sitting on both sides of you. Okay. Our behavior changes, the sitting pattern changes, the way we respond uh, to the situation that changes. So, what happens in the case of uh, social facilitation? The behavior is guided by the fact that you are in a group setup. The best example for in the animal kingdom because we have been talking about instincts, biological creatures and such things is that animals they, uh, they eat faster when they are in a group rather than when they are all alone. Important also from uh, the learning perspective is the fact that the observer modifies behavior after demonstration of it. Okay. So, you have uh, know the model, you try to imitate the model and then you try to map whether your action is leading you towards the goal or not. In between there could be a possibility that based on certain feedback you change the trajectory of your behavior, you change the course of your behavior okay, in order to achieve goal. Say for instance, uh, perhaps one of the best examples could be uh, where you have set a target for yourself, the example that we took in the previous lecture that uh, you have set the target of achieving uh, say the president medal or uh, say scholar batch after attaining the highest possible score in your group. But then it is not only the goal that matter, it what also matters is the means that you adopt for it, whether I prepare myself well for the exam and then attain the maximum possible score or I go for cheating and then score the maximum possible score. Okay. Now, what happens although you have set the target, achievement of the target is that uh, something that you are eyeing for, but then it is not uh, you know, only merely achieving the highest score in your exam, rather the means that you adopt, how 
whether it is a socially celebrated, socially acceptable uh, model of behavior which will help you attain the goal or anyhow you attain the goal and nobody will care know what means was adopted to attain that goal. So, that is very in, uh, interesting and important in case of human beings. Now, uh, that we are uh, left with just few minutes to end this topic, let us talk about two important constructs. One, the experiment uh, performed by Ebbinghaus. Uh, what Ebbinghaus did was uh, that uh, he created uh, uh, three letter uh, composites, what are in psychology called as nonsense syllables. Okay. Nonsense syllables is just the opposite of meaningful words. For instance, uh, say we say cat. Now, C, A, T are three independent alphabets, but when put together, human beings consider that this is a meaningful word, it represents an animal. But say for example, uh, you have something like N, L, A, okay, O, F, P. These are you know collection of uh, alphabets, but they does not make any sense. So, these uh, meaningless type of assembly of letters, which does not allow you uh, to make a mental representation, because they are nonsense. Therefore, they are called nonsense syllables. And nonsense syllables are basically you know uh, very generously used in uh, research in psychology, because it helps you understand learning in its purest form. If you use meaningful words, then many uh, you know context dependent variables will interfere with the outcome and you will not be uh, in a position to come forward with the purest form of research outcome. It will have confounding factors. You want to eliminate those confounding factors and therefore, uh, you need uh, uh, things which although might appear nonsense, but it helps you uh, help it helps you understand how people learn. What Ebbinghaus did was, he created uh, you know, a set of nonsense syllables with three letters and then he wanted to understand that uh, uh, when we learn, okay, what is the rate of learning, how many attempts do you take okay, and what is the success rate. So, what he did was he plotted a curve out of it. The curve basically had the number of attempts here. So, the number of attempts here, how many trials do you take, first time, second time, likewise no, first time, second time, third time, fourth time. So, likewise know the number of trials and here on the y axis he had the percentage of recall. How many uh, of the nonsense syllables were you able to recall? What he realized was very interesting and this is called as learning curve. Okay. In the beginning our learning is slow and suddenly you realize that there is a steep progress. Okay. You learn very fast. And then after a particular level, you realize that you reach a level of stability, what is the call as the plateau state. No? So, no more learning or no more significant enhancement in learning after that, that is called as the plateau state. So, slow beginning, reaching the plateau state and in between you have a very steep progress, that is what is called as learning curve and this was given by Hermann Ebbinghaus. Now, at the end, let us now uh, talk about transfer of learning. Is it that learning of one thing helps us learn the other thing? So, is it that uh, what we learn uh, first has any influence on what we learn later on? Okay. What could be the possibility? Okay. So, the facilitatory role or the inhibitory role or perhaps no role that the previously learned thing has over the new thing, the incoming learning information that is what is called as transfer of learning. There are three possibilities, positive transfer can be there. For example, when you learn one task and the acquisition of uh, you know, uh, the first skill helps you understand and learn the second set of tasks that is the example of positive transfer. For example, you learn how to ride a bicycle, okay. uh, you learn how to pedal, you learn how to you know, uh, balance the vehicle, you learn how to take turns, you learn how to use brake, the entire mechanism you learn. Next time, when you learn uh, riding a motorbike, you realize that it is now facilitated, only few mechanisms have to, has to be learned. Okay. 
but otherwise riding your bicycle has very uh, easily uh, helped you to learn the new skill that is uh, driving a motorbike. This is an example of positive transfer. Earlier uh, learned task facilitates acquisition of the new task, positive transfer. The other possibility is a negative transfer. Negative transfer would be a case where thing that you have learned previously, now it interrupts learning of the subsequent thing. Okay. You know that in few countries, uh, you have uh, cars with steering on the left side and in few countries, you have cars with steering on the right side. For instance, in our country, we have the cars with the steering on the right side. Okay. Imagine if you are made to drive a car, okay, if you ask me to drive a car with the steering on the left, okay, how would I perform? And it has been realized that the left hand driving, it always hinders the learning of driving using the right hand. Okay. Those who you know, we ours is uh, you know, uh, left lane drive, okay. so you always you are supposed to be on the left side. Okay. In few countries, the rule is different. No, you are supposed to be on the right side. Okay. So, you have great difficulty because you have learned task in a particular way and this learning has now started interfering when you have to learn things in a new situation. Such type of interferences, they are called negative transfer because it is adversely affecting learning of the subsequent task. And another possibility could be that the previously learned thing and the new coming thing, both of them are completely disconnected. There is no connect between the two. So, learning of one task does not affect the performance on the other task. And the best example could be that after you know, attending uh, how many 12 lectures uh, of this very course, if you have to learn how to ride a motorbike, knowledge of psychology is not going to either positively or negatively interfere or help in driving the motorbike. So, there is zero transfer. This is a different thing that is a different ball game altogether. So, knowledge of psychology has no relation with driving of motorbike. This is the example of uh, zero transfer. So, you realize that this does not work. This is the case of zero transfer. So, with this we come to our uh, uh, what do you call uh, the end of our discussion on learning. What we have done till now? We have talked about how we sense stimuli in the world, how we assign meaning, how we perceive things. Having perceived things, we learn certain things. No? There are certain uh, uh, guiding principles. We are biological creatures. There are some certain biocultural factors, okay. certain things which we passively learn, certain things that we actively engage ourselves and then we learn. First was classical case, second was the operant conditioning case something uh, know which we learn because of our insights, there are uh, cognitive factors that helps in this phenomena and now having perceived things, I have learned things now. Okay. What after this? After I have learned, I will try to retain it. When I retain it and that retention helps me recollect that information which further facilitates my healthy survival, that is what is called memory. So, when we meet next, we will be talking about a new concept that is memory.